Good morning and welcome. Uh, we love the size of the group, so thank you for spending your morning with us. And what I promise to do is we'll make this very interactive. I'll spend about 20, 25 minutes going through a couple of comments. And then I really want to make sure we're touching on the topics that are on your mind. So we're going to spend almost a half hour just in Q&A. No questions off limits, and I'll provide a wonderful perspective of what it's like on the front lines. Because the purpose of today's talk is everything you're learning. And taking that, whether it's an engineering degree, a business degree, a medical degree, and wrapping in a few additional components. So you take your talent, your expertise, we're going to add in problem solving. I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem solving component, which when you put the two together, equal a career. And that's really been my experience in the hallmark of my career. I spent, coming out of a state school in New Jersey, I spent 25 years in industry, 10 years at General Electric. Started out at GE Corporate, uh, actually up in Crotonville to NBC and dealing with Dateline, which you'll talk a little bit about. From there, I followed my GE manager. Really, a manufacturing company's important. They do very, very important things, but they spend about 1% to 3% of revenue on technology, whereas a financial company spends 10 to 12%, 14% of revenue on technology. So I followed my GE manager into the financials, really driving trading systems and doing matching across 30 different countries sub-second. And then from there into yet a third aspect with Kaiser Permanente and taking that technology capability and using it to improve the quality of care, improve health outcomes, and change the way care is delivered. But it required a foundation of capabilities, a foundation of skill that you layer on some problem solving. And it's amazing that I, I tell you, 25 years ago, I wouldn't have predicted my career. I was just enjoying what I was doing and having a lot of fun. But realize that by taking base skills, base engineering, base business capabilities, adding in a little bit of problem solving, it's amazing what happens. So I started my technology side. Actually, uh, this goes back to my grandparents, if you believe that. This was back when telephones weren't mobile. They had wires in them. <laughs> my grandfather worked for the phone company. My dad worked for the phone company. So I grew up with boxes of microphones and parts and uh, actually started going to school for computer science and putting phone systems in and, uh, over summer breaks. And from there, that was quickly becoming computerized. Next, I was putting in computer systems. And then ultimately found myself with that base capability, just solving problems. It's pretty simple. And then by solving problems, next thing you know, we're stitching gigabit uh, laser beams over the Hudson River. We're written up in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, through, um, and we were talking about networking. Uh, three years ago, I received my first patent, patent on network intrusion mitigation. But it wasn't to invent capability. It was to stop viruses from spreading. So there was one thing I didn't learn in school. There's a lot I didn't learn in school. But one thing that stuck with me is how to do that. So uh, I know we've got a lot of uh, engineering and computer science majors in here. Who's heard of the OSI seven-layer model? You know, your network, your physics. We built an entire industry on a seven-layer model. And what I realized is there's actually a 10-layer model. You take your normal seven layers, physical all the way up through application, and then you get to a business world, and it doesn't work. This is something they never taught me in school, but the seven-layer model doesn't work. Uh, what I realize is there's a 10-layer model. So on top of your seven, you need to add religion, politics, and finance. And if you can solve for those extra three layers, you make a world of difference. And it's really bridging that gap that changes a trajectory from an incredibly important, valuable contributor to an incredibly important industry leader. So it's very simple and very straightforward, but you add in the pure talent, the pure capability, layer in three layers of problem solving, and you really build a career path. That's important at Kaiser Permanente because Kaiser Permanente is a nonprofit system. We are focused on improving health outcomes. We don't want to make shareholder value, absolutely not. We want to keep people healthy. And that's kind of different than the entire country. And that's really what healthcare reform or Obamacare is supposed to do is a step, but doesn't get us there. And here's why. 
the U.S. health system has insurers at the top of it, the payers, and they're important. They collect revenue. They love you because you don't get sick. You're what we call young invincibles or young and healthies. But you pay into insurance, and they take that money, and they spread that risk across the whole population. And about 75% of health care costs today is uh, targeted towards people who are 65 or older. Three quarters of the health care costs go to our aging population. It's generally dealing with chronic diseases. So insurers are important, but if they don't pay your bill, they make more money. And we've got one insurer who spends 6.38% um, of their revenues rejected claims. They just reject 6.38% of their claims outright. So then you have doctors. So you've got insurers on the top, your payers. You've got the providers, the doctors, who want to do a good job, who are using incredible biomed technology, doing great treatments, but they have to get paid. So they can't answer an email because they can't bill for that. You have to have a 20-minute visit for a doctor to get paid. And the more a doctor does, the more the doc gets paid. So if they turn around and you go in with the onset of an infection and they treat it, they get paid. If you get sicker, and they don't want that, they honestly don't, you go back and they do another procedure, they get paid more. And the sicker you get, the more they get. So it's just a disconnected set of systems. And then you've got pharmaceuticals. I tell you, I've learned more from pharmaceuticals on primetime TV, seeing ads about all these weird dysfunctions <laughs> than I've ever learned from my doctor. So what you have is a pharmaceutical company negotiating with an insurance company. They have to get on the formula, and if they don't, well, then they take out a TV ad, and, and they tell you all about these wonderful things that we never wanted to know about. And at the end of the day, we're, we're left in the middle of it. How do we integrate? How do we integrate? And why is technology? On the biomed side, on acute treatment, technology is great. CAT scans are going from 128 slices at 9 meg per to 256 uh, slices per scan. Great treatment capabilities. But why isn't information technology part of this? And it's because the system is disconnected. No one wants that information to flow, but at the end of the day, it's vital to our health. And that's what Kaiser Permanente does. By being a nonprofit, Kaiser is a vertically integrated healthcare provider. Kaiser, Mayo, Geisinger, Group Health, Intermountain, Cleveland Clinic. And we're built to prevent the onset of disease. We're built to prevent the onset of chronic conditions which is why we invest in people's health, why we invest in data and analytics, why every single night, I can take you and I can show you the servers in our data center that pull the blood coagulation levels out of every one of our members and compare that with their Coumadin dosages. Because Coumadin, blood thinner, it's incredibly important if you had a stroke. If you had a stroke, we've got to thin your blood, want to make sure you stay healthy. But it's, in, it's almost impossible to get that dosage perfect, and it drifts. So we've got computers every single night actually comparing your Coumadin dosages with your blood coagulation levels. And every morning, alerts get kicked out to docs. We need to adjust this patient. We need to bring this patient in. We don't want you to collapse. We don't want you to get sick. On heart attacks, you are more likely in heart attack it, I would think it's cancer. It's not. Heart attack is the number one killer in the United States, the number one killer. Yet at Kaiser, you're less likely to die from a heart attack than anywhere else. It's now the number two killer in some of our areas because we take analytics and data, and we run them every night. We do a full ETL, extract, transform, and load, of problems, medications, allergies, alerts, immunization. And then we have panels of docs analyzing that for what works best. How do we get the best outcome? How do we stop someone from having a second heart attack within 90 days? And then we take that and we put that into the hands of physicians at point of care with care panels. And you know, if something breaks quickly, we'll have docs staying up all night long. 
some of these alerts, some of these care protocols go out at night, and that's the difference technology makes. Why isn't the whole country doing this? Why can we get music and video streamed to our cell phones? Why can we walk into a car dealership and buy a car on a signature? Yet, when I, I'll share with you just a very personal experience. So my father had been battling cancer for many years, uh, five years first prostrate and that was brought under control. And then he, he had an event one night. He collapsed in the shower at three in the morning. And we weren't living with him. No one knew about that until the next day, uh, right after lunch, my sister went over to see him and found him laying on the shower floor, internal bleeding. It was really a, just a horrific situation. So he was rushed to uh, the emergency room in intensive care. I jumped on a plane. My sister my, uh, jumped on a plane. We're there. And he's, he's barely coherent. He's had so much blood loss that there's an emergency physician asking him what's wrong. He, he's barely coherent. And uh, she says, are you on any medication? And these are chemotherapy. And she said, what do you have? What, what medication? He goes, uh, how many times a day do you take it? He's like, uh, three. And then my stepmom, his wife, there. she said, no, I think you take this twice a day. And we're here. It's like, I have no idea. And here are physicians trying to make the most important decisions, potentially the most important decisions of our lives, with nothing. Usher Kaiser, we've implemented full electronic medical record capability across the entire Kaiser Permanente organization. We have over 9 million members. Everyone is 100% digital. All of our hospitals have been audited and validated to be truly paperless hospitals. Look at the rest of the country. We as a country, we've got great technology. We've got incredible, incredible capabilities, yet half of the United States is still on paper records. Half. That's pathetic. That is just flat out pathetic. And if you look at the change in healthcare, the work you're doing, combining pure technology, whether it's networking and security to computer science, to connectivity with biomedical devices, which are just streaming a ton of incredibly important information, connecting that with analytics, and then all of a sudden, we know how to help people get better. We have panels of docs that actually sit here and look at outcomes. It's kind of, it's kind of like any other self-improving closed-loop system. But the U.S. healthcare is not a closed loop system. Your results are on paper. You go see a doc, writes down a diagnosis, you leave. That doc doesn't see you again. He doesn't know if you got better, went to a different doc, or you died. He doesn't know. We track those results and use the capability and the analytics to feed that back in to see what really works. Who here has heard of Lipitor? Very, very important, $17 billion Pfizer drug. Big success, improved people's health. Who here has heard of Vioxx? Slightly different story. So Vioxx came on the scene. It was being prescribed. And what we started seeing, because of the closed loop, because of the evidence, because of the comparative effectiveness, as we started seeing people dying. And there was more than a statistical correlation. We pulled Vioxx overnight out of our formulary. Alerts went out. Anyone on Vioxx was immediately bought in. Prescriptions changed. We stopped prescribing Vioxx two years before the FDA pulled it, two years before Merck pulled it. We notified the FDA the instant we detected problems. And it took a while. It took studies. It took gathering data, data we already had. 
for the rest of the world to realize. If you track the outcome, you build a closed system, you put in the medical informatics, you run some analytics against it, you can change people's lives. And in this case, it's to try and keep people healthy, to delay the onset. 51% of our health is going to be totally driven by what we do today, tomorrow, the day after, by what we have for lunch, by what we have for dinner, by our lifestyle choices. Yet at the end of the day, if we do that well, the U.S. healthcare system doesn't succeed. But the U.S. healthcare system is fundamentally broken in that it's a two and a half trillion dollar industry. It's 17.8, 17.9% 7 of our GDP. It's growing at around 6% a year. I know you guys are going to do well. You're getting a phenomenal education. You're going to solve business problems on top of that. And you're going to have, have incomes that grow much faster than that. But the rest of the country isn't. It's a broken system. And it's a system that, on a quality perspective, we rank like 37th in the world. We rank really, really poorly. And that's where you can make a difference. All you have to do is take some technology, solve the business problems, and wrap it together. And that's what Kaiser Permanente is here to do, just really apply technology to support caregivers, to support physicians at point of care in a very preventative way. And when you look at IT and how IT supports that, it really needs to change as well. In much the same way that we have a seven-layer OSI model that works brilliantly in a lab environment, works brilliantly in the visualization lab I toured earlier today, but it doesn't translate to business. It doesn't translate to the real world until you connect those top three layers, religion, politics, and finance. And I go back to um, Steve Jobs and a quote that's in his book multiple times, but really was a hallmark of his career. It was actually something he learned at Atari. Believe it or not, something Jobs learned at Atari building the Pong machine. And that is, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. We learn in areas of deep, deep expertise. The silo is on the left. You can call it windows. You can call it network. You can call it security. We learn our disciplines, coding, Java programming, and become incredible experts in deep silos. Yet the world's moving to simplicity. And the trick, the art, becomes masking, hiding, addressing all that complexity, actually building what's truly an elegant solution by attacking that complexity head on, layering in your top three layers. And that's where technology's going. That's where careers are going connecting between deep expertise and business problems. And it's not just Kaiser. It's not just the transformation we're going through. Other companies are so far ahead. We're seeing cloud. Who's actually provisioned a cloud image, whether on Amazon or any other environment? That sure is different, and it's a very different experience than ordering a server out of my organization. Um, we support over a quarter of a million computers just out of my team alone. I've got about 1,900 employees and contractors literally working 24 hours a day. We've got five large data centers and over a quarter of a million computers. And we're moving boxes, computers, servers in trucks. It's big, it's heavy lifting, you've got engineering challenges. But at the end of the day, other companies are addressing that complexity. They're not dealing with the different towers, the code. They're putting in front ends. They're building elegant solutions. So when I meet with um, Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of VMware, we, we sit down over breakfast and we talk about what companies are doing. When I sit down with Amazon, I'm telling you, I respect the heck out of Amazon because they built an entire company on a two-pizza rule. I'm like, what the heck's a two-pizza rule? 
they don't build big monolithic systems, they build services. And they have really bright teams of people such as yourselves. And they said, once a team gets so big, you can't feed it with two pizzas, you break it apart. <laughs> it's too big, you have two services. And Amazon's built an incredibly, incredibly responsive business model on a two pizza rule. With EMC, they call it, they call it adolescence. I'm like, huh? They said their whole IT department at EMC, and sitting down with their CTO, he describes it as, oh yeah, we're adolescents. We're kind of gawky, we're ungangy, we're uncomfortable. That's because they're going from the model here on the left, different silos, into a seamless model, a cloud-based model. The whole world's going to cloud, cloud user self-service. It doesn't have to be outside, it can be inside. What it does is it takes that complexity it takes all your brilliance of the deep expertise, it just wraps three layers, just three simple layers, religion, politics, and finance. And I don't even care which layer you want to practice. Add those three layers and it changes the world. So these companies are very, very quickly moving away from the structures you see, from the silos, into a very, very clean, very elegant companies that are frankly building the future. And that's the transformation we're starting to see across the tech industry and across very leading companies. I would ask as you interview with different firms, think about the type of organization you're joining. Whether it's Kaiser Permanente, whether it's Google, whether it's Yahoo, are you joining the type of organization that's siloed on the left? Or are you joining the or type of organization that's trying to change, trying to transform an industry? Healthcare, the technology and the promise is so, so ripe for important, really fundamental transformation. And what a way to help change the country. So the evolution is really moving from a project focus with everything custom built to that elegant simplicity. Just making it easy, masking, hiding, solving, solving the challenges of complexity with a little bit more art, and that makes all the difference in the world. So I wanted to share just five moments of truth over my 25-year career, and then go into open <coughs> Q&A. And each one of these um, describes how that deep technical expertise marries with a business problem. And it happens when just a plus plus in an Etsy R hosts file Turns into, a I, turns into a phone call on a five-minute segment on Dateline NBC. So the tech, a plus-plus in Etsy our host. Um, many of you know that's just remote access, unlimited permission. When you find it in an internet server, it's a bad day. In my case, it was a bad week. <laughs> and, and it's summarized with a hacker getting through a General Electric in a five-minute segment on Dateline. Or a PC, in security, a PC, once you take data, and in this case it was employee information. In medical data, it's even worse. Who's had a letter show up saying, hey, good news, you get free credit reporting for a year? Or <laughs> who's had that happen? <laughs> it, it's okay, because you get free reporting and you get a new credit card in the mail. Got it. As medical records digitize, if a medical record is lost, your HIV status doesn't change. You can't reissue a new HIV status. You can't. So what happens when a PC with 300,000 accounts is lost? I'll tell you exactly what happened. 300,000 Hewlett Packard employees had their names, addresses, social security numbers lost, got free credit reporting, and I learned more about encryption in the next two years than I ever thought I needed to know. Or Twin Towers. I was in lower Manhattan, um, worked in downtown Manhattan when the towers came down. What do you do when you lose all connectivity and all capability? One of the things we did, you can read about it in the Wall Street Journal, is I connected gigabit infrared laser beams across the Hudson River because there was nothing left underneath. And how do you stay in business? And then how do you explain that to Dave Kamansky and Stan O'Neill, 
CEO and chairman, three times a day on not gigabit razors, but how we're going to support the reopening of the stock exchange, how we're going to support the retirement and the trading income of all the Merrill Lynch account holders. Or another moment of truth is when your website ends up on TV. Uh, you would think that would be good. It's not. <laughs> it really isn't. <laughs> For a whole lot of reasons. In this case, it was a quick lesson in horizontal scale out computing. And this was the Olympics. This was Amanda Beard. This was 96. It, it was in very early days. I supported and literally built uh, GE's very first website. A year later, the same thing with NBC. And these things are running on just little Sun server, Sun OS, we loved it. And um, next thing you know, the Olympics are coming up, and we're going to do a little bit of a plug on NBC.com. So that's great. We got monitors up. We're all watching. Amanda Beard is swimming, and they say, find out more about her in NBC.com. So these were the days without fourth generation wireless, and uh, these were the days of You've Got Mail and AOL. So I have no idea how many people were able to dial up the internet so quickly, but we saw the on-air flash. 45 seconds later, NBC.com went off the air. 45 seconds. So that's what happens when your website ends up on TV. We learned how to scale horizontally really quick, and you would never want to do NFS mounts across 20 servers, but we had them in two days later, and the next on air worked. Or what, what do you do when someone says, okay, we got a data center problem, and in this case, it was kp.org. kp.org was being uh, built at a third-party data center because people didn't think we had the ability internally to support it. People thought, we were this old siloed organization model and said we can't uh, support kp.org. And it's a portal for 9 million people. So then the co-location center had a problem. And um, I was asked, well, can we take kp.org and put it in our own data centers? So we got great data centers. And um, I kind of got a little bit ahead of my team and very proud of them. I said, yes, give us a weekend. Now, it, t it was a long weekend. It was a three-day weekend. <laughs> but uh, Friday night, we had trucks there. It was engineering. It was cables in advance. And in a weekend, over 400 servers went from Las Vegas overnight to our data center in Northern California, bolted back together and up for business in a weekend. So I really wanted to uh, spend the next 20 minutes or so, 15 minutes, understanding what's on your minds. I know you're hearing a lot with healthcare reform. I know you've got a lot going on with your studies. I know some of you know a little bit about Kaiser from its history 40, 50 years ago through the technology transformation over the last decade. Uh, why don't we go ahead and open this up to any questions any of you have? Yes? I'd like to get a better feel for the um, current state and availability of continuous monitoring. I've seen you know, a 60 minute segment on uh, that guy, I can't remember his name from. Uh, I think it's an SIO who is a proponent of uh, devices that you, know, you're, you put a uh, case on your iPhone yes. and you put a couple of fingers on it and it shows your science rhythm for your heart or you know you monitor your blood sugar levels. You were talking about Coumadin. Uh, I think I'm wondering, it sounds like what you're saying is that uh, for KT um, uh, clients, they can wear something that's ongoing. You're taking these measurements uh, in real time and then doing analytics on it, is that the case? Or are we just talking about when they visit their doctor and they have a blood sample taken, so it's, it's more stretch, stretched out, like maybe a monthly visit or something? And that's really the explosion of data and the explosion of capabilities. We're just at the very, very early stages of that. And we'll put in people's homes biomed devices that in home will do uh, things like uh, blood sugar levels and report that back. But more importantly, it's becoming wearable. You can now get little add-ons that connect into your iPhone and start doing your own vital monitoring. I have a Fitbit. Keeps track of how I walk, how I sleep. You've got uh, up bracelets doing the same thing. And at the end of the day, that type of instrumentation can keep you from getting sick, provide the early alerts, and frankly, provide the correlation. Uh, I, Marilyn Chow is a brilliant caregiver. She's the head of our nurse. We have over 45,000 nurses alone at Kaiser Permanente. 
almost 17,000 docs, over 45,000 nurses. And we're working with her because she can walk into a patient room at 3 in the morning. And they've been through surgery, they're out of the ICU, and a skilled nurse comes in and says, this patient's having a problem. The vitals look good, the instrumentation, the pulse ox is good, but a nurse can sit there and tell you, you know, they're not doing well. And what we're now seeing is we've got um, people writing algorithms that take 40 different markers, and they start correlating those, and all of a sudden, they can predict when a person, uh, person's starting to crash. And unfortunately, I believe it was 75% accurate, they were predicting people uh, passing away. 75% accurate. Oh my goodness, how do you get that data and intervene earlier? So that's really what's starting to happen. I think continuously connected devices, even sleep patterns. You, there's now an app you can take your iPhone just lay it on your bed. It will detect, based on how much you move, your sleep cycle rhythms, and that's useful in treating sleep apnea as well as when you should wake up. So big data is essential in collecting this, and the United States isn't geared for this. It honestly isn't, because the FDA is trying to regulate a mobile phone. Uh, we know how good they do regulating medical equipment, and they do a good job, but there's a reason it takes seven years to get a drug through FDA on a fast path, and 10 to 12 years on normal cycles. It's slow. And how do we get that data very, very quickly and start acting on it? So there's a lot of work underway in tying in that instrumentation, not only from the home, but the wearable instrumentation. It really makes a big difference if you're focused on staying healthy. It's great for acute treatment and reactive treatment, but its biggest opportunity, in my opinion, is in keeping you healthy. And it's getting to a U.S. healthcare system that's invested in your health as much as we are. Yes, we'll go here. So is Kaiser Permanente like, sponsoring your research into these kind of biomedical devices? Is it trying to serve as a testing ground for some new devices? Like, what do you guys do to incorporate new technology into your preventative medicine and kind of class? So what we do uh, specifically for technology, we have an innovation center, or Garfield Labs. We actually, it's a mocked up hospital. We have operating rooms, patient rooms, we've got movable walls. And we actually bring in device manufacturers, we bring in caregivers, we bring in physicians and nurses, and we actually use that as a test bed, not just for technology, new technology capability, and we've got wearable devices in there. We actually have visualization sensors, but we take that and use that with our providers, with the GEs, with the Philips systems, and really look at ways to change the entire care delivery from process to tools all the way to treatment. What we also do is we take the data and we run analytics. Uh, we have a division of research with hundreds of researchers because what we have is now over 9 million longitudinal records outcome-based on entire health. So it, it's not like a normal medical study like the 2003 RAND study. It took two years of nurses to try and decipher doctor's writing. We <laughs> try to decipher doctor's writing two years to figure out how to keep people healthy. We do that in two minutes. So we actually take our data, we anonymize it, and we participate with other research institutes on longitudinal studies. And what we're finding is our data is more valuable because it's so complete. It's longitudinal, it has full medication allergies, problems, immunizations. We've got utilization. And with that, on a demographic that spans from Hawaii to mid-Atlantic states, from newborns or neonatals, all the way to uh, elder care, we can see the outcomes and see when Vioxx is having an adverse reaction. So we actually participate in several National Institute of Health studies. We've got uh, studies underway right now on chemotherapy effectiveness, on the pharmacological components of chemotherapy treatment. We've got studies underway for cardiovascular disease, and we just received a grant for a genetic study. So we're beginning the 
early collection of what uh, will be one of the largest early genetic studies. You had a question back here, and then we'll go to you. Yeah, so um, over the past decade, uh, medical device recalls due to software errors have risen from under 10% to over 20. And that's kind of a terrifying situation, especially with pacemakers. But you can also imagine extreme risk due to bugs in analytics. For example, if there's a drug that is a, there's a bug in your analytics software, it looks like the drug is not effective, so you pull it when actually it was helping people. You can imagine a lot of costs. Or if there's something that isn't effective, but then it looks indicated is, you can imagine a cost there. So what do you guys do to address the problems of software errors in these critical uh, software systems that are used in healthcare? Now, no. there was an, I don't mean this to disparage any company. There was an old joke about why doesn't Microsoft make cars like General Motors does? And it's because if you had a car made by Microsoft, you'd have to crash and reboot every day. <laughs> um, it takes a lot more care to put into software when it's supporting life critical systems. So we actually break our components down, even from an IT perspective, into business facing and what we call circle of support. And circle of support for us is the life critical systems. And that's where we have layers of redundancy, we have backups with backups. And then when you look at the output of the data, at the end of the day, a care decision is always a physician to a patient. So when we have a best practice protocol, it pops in front of the physician. When we have a drug-to-drug -drug interaction alert, and th one of the sad things is this year, 2013, 100,000 people in America are going to die because of a medication error. 100,000 people are going to die this year because of a medication error. We do drug-to-drug -drug interaction alerts. It's not that you got one medication from one doctor, one medication from another, a third medication, and no one knows it, or you were prescribed something with an allergy. We do a drug-to-drug -drug interaction alert at point of care. But then to your point, that's not good enough. It pops an alert. The physician then has to look at it. When we come up with care protocols like the Biox, we bring in a team of uh, cross practitioners. They'll work day, I mean, sometimes they'll work till midnight and then put an alert out that then gets built into the treatment flow, the treatment protocol, our care protocol for all 16,000 plus docs but you still have the human being, you still have the trained, licensed physician taking that information and doing what's appropriate for the patient. Have you ever found an error where a doctor got a recommendation from the system and that seemed wrong and they pushed back and said, actually, I think that there's a problem in your system? Or mm -hmm. have you found bugs this way? Or? I won't call it a bug because um, in medicine, they call it practice. It's a practice of medicine. I, I sure can't wait until we're beyond practicing where we know it. But human beings are so complex, it is a practice. And we actually look at care protocols that provide much better outcomes in general. Physicians do override it. And we track that. And then what we do is we actually measure the quality doc by doc. So we literally look at outcomes. And we grade every doc based on the quality outcomes. And if a doc's overriding, alerts or protocols, and their patients are doing better. And we've got treatments, like for childhood leukemia, we've got a treatment protocol 98% of the time that pediatric or leukemia patients going to do well. 90, some of them are that good. Many aren't. Many are in the 80s. But if we see docs suddenly starting to have outcomes that are below 98% for childhood leukemia, they're pulled out and dis their practice is discussed with the attending and the chief physicians. If we've got docs that are doing better, they're on the next panel. <laughs> they're looking at the next set of data for the next care protocol. So at the end of the day, it's not perfect. It's much, much better. Statistically, quantifiably, it's much better than a paper-based world. And it's taking that data, building the closed loop system, and then making the comparative effectiveness advances that you can make so very quickly. Medicine hasn't changed a whole lot in the last 100 years. Yeah, so we don't do lobotomies. But we fill people up with radiation and toxic chemicals. I mean, that's, oh, oh my goodness, that's like bloodletting. That, that, that's that crude. 
we got to get that cycle of improvement faster and faster. Okay. You had a question, yes. Can you elaborate on the, the top three areas of the model? Certainly, religion, politics, and finance. Here's what I mean by that, and I'll share just a personal example, almost an embarrassing example. To me, it's so simple. User self-service, we can spin up entire technology environments. If they want to run a uh, thousand node Hadoop cluster, great. All you're doing is layering in a thousand uh, Linux images, putting in some software. So brilliant idea to move from boxes, which is my whole organizational model. I, an internal provider of service at Kaiser Permanente, and we've got people delivering service to different departments, and then those departments pay for it, and that allows us to buy more equipment to deliver more service. It's a virtuous cycle. Uh, Porter's five forces, everything's in perfect balance. And we're trying to get to the future. We're trying to abstract the complexity of people ordering storage and network and tunics and all the different components. So it's like, okay, great. Well, we can come up with an elegant solution, going back to jobs, where simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It's as easy as Emma. We built an internal private cloud. Web front page, you want a medium Linux box, a large Linux box, it's great all ready to go put it in production, and that's when I realized again, and you'd think I'd know better. I've been bumping into this uh, since the 90s. I didn't solve for religion, politics, and finance. So I got this brilliant solution. It's, it's spectacular. It's gonna change the way we can deliver service. And I put in an appropriation for a few million dollars, and it's like, we can't approve that. And I'm like, WTF? <laughs> And for me, that meant, oh, I forgot religion, politics, and finance. What I didn't realize in that case, the politics worked because uh, our customers wanted it and it made it easier and they didn't have to go through these big, long request cycles. The religion worked because I had Windows images and Linux images. So if there was a religious issue, we had, we, we had both, okay. <laughs> Where I blew it was on the finance. My finance organization knows how to bill for a big box that's permanent. It's got a three, four, five year depreciation life cycle, it goes into our fixed asset register, it's on our general ledger system. They know how to build for that. To this day, we can't render an internal bill for renting of a virtual system. So that's where I personally missed the finance component. Now the good news is I put it in anyway, I got the support I needed, and we've deployed and had self-service creation of over 2,500 images. The better news is more than half of them have been turned off. In the past, we found people worked so hard to get their own environments that when they were done with them, they'd never give them back, they'd keep them. I had a little black market going on in servers and compute. Now it comes up and down. But for me, that's just a real world and very recent example. I should know better. And I missed a, level, I missed a layer. We, have a <laughs> <laughs> we should compare notes. Maybe we can trade. I think we've got time for maybe two more two questions. questions. Yes. Um, so you, you have this, this wonderful medical record. And then there are a lot of people like yourself who have Fitbits and maybe Zeos and other such devices. Um, uh, what are the, uh, let's say, major obstacles to um, for in the future, integrate the, the data that people collect that way into your medical record so that doctors can see it and also that maybe your system can maybe automatically analyze the data and, and give warnings to your members when their health deteriorates. So some of the challenges to that, and we're trying to address those challenges with something called a capsule, first in an inpatient setting. And a capsule is a little Wi-Fi device that'll do an HL7 integration for the different biomed equipment components, even IV pumps. Something as simple as a little pump, you hang a bag of saline in it with some drugs and it measures how much gets in, uh, into your system. We just bought 15,000 new IV pumps, large bore. Every single one of them has a wireless access point built in and can be remotely controlled. So what we're now doing, first with an inpatient setting, is taking that data and connecting it and then building the rule sets 
for what gets put into your permanent medical record. There are challenges. The challenges are just like an insulin pump and security. There have been cases where insulin pumps have been hacked. Is, is this IV pump actually secure enough? And then how do you trust the data? How do you, and that's why PHRs, personal health records, don't really seem to be as valuable in a clinical setting as an electronic medical record. Now, I'm not going to say I'm like this, but I, I, whether it's life insurance or when I'm talking to my physician, if they read that I'm 150 pounds, have lots of hair, smile, and only eat broccoli, I, I mean, I'm never going to misstate anything like that. But sometimes people stretch the truth a little. So the other challenge is trust, trust of the data. How do you have non-repudiation of the data? These will get solved. These have been solved in, in many other industries. They're going to get solved in healthcare, and they're going to get solved much quicker. Meanwhile, my life, I got a Fitbit in my pocket. I get these wonderful, buoyant emails like once a week. Hey, in fact, yesterday I just got my 747 badge. That meant I went up and down enough stairs to be up at the 35,000 foot cruising altitude of a 747. And I stand on my scale, and it actually does a BMI. It does, as long as I'm barefoot, it measures my body mass index, which is a ratio of fat to non-fat, and my weight. And I get a little graph every week of how much I'm running, or walking in my case, and uh, how I'm doing. So we're there. We are so close. What we have to do is figure out the interface standards, and then we have to figure out how to turn it into non-repudiable data. I have time for one last question, and then I'm going to ask Scott to join the stage. Yes? So going back to your top three layers, so, so doctors, much like faculty, uh, are known for being humble and welcoming of criticism. Uh, <laughs> 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 and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you've done a lot of analytics, and, and undoubtedly along the way you identify that there are things that some doctors do, and many doctors may do, that they're convinced is a good idea, mm -hmm. that in fact maybe isn't a good idea. And, or some that may be in their interest, but may not be in all their patients' interest. And so, like, well, can you talk a little bit about your experience with the politics, religion, and finance of hitting up against that wall, that differences in the data-centric view, and the, look, I'm the doctor view. Absolutely. It's a brilliant question, and it really ties to the heart of what we're doing. Whether it's technology, computer science, biomed, business, it's taking that deep expertise that a physician has through years of residency and uh, medical studies and solving real world problems. The way we do it, it's really, really simple. It's show me the data. So what we do is we actually take that doctor and we do it in a private setting because medicine's a practice. You go to medical school here, Dr. John Madison is a graduate here he co-chairs several IT medical informatics committees. I cover the tech side. He covers everything that's brilliant. And I love working with him. But he'll be the first to tell you, you take a doc aside, and they learned how to practice medicine somewhere. And different schools have different specialties, different biases, and they're not closed-loop systems. So you say, well, you know, I know you're really bright, medicine. But what you're doing is not as good. They're going to they're gonna call you on it. They're not going to agree. So then what we do is we show them how they stack up against all the other docs. We show them the outcome. We say, well, yeah, here's the last 25 patients you treated. And here's, because we have the data, the comparative effectiveness, here's how they did. That puts you in the bottom quartile of all doctors. <laughs> and we show them where they stack up. Here are the ones that are doing it really good. And here are the ones that are doing it really bad. No doctor wants to be at the bottom of the list. They're so competitive. They're so proud. All we do, the physicians sit down with the docs. It's a closed loop, quality-based outcome, comparative effect. It's amazing how quick docs can change. And that's how we do it. We honestly, it's data-based. We come back and we look at their entire panel of patients, how their patients do. And then we show them how they stack up on the list of all doctors. And mid to upper pack, great. You get the doctors at the bottom, well, they're incredibly motivated to move up. And if not, we do have other actions that we then take. But it's all data driven. So I wanted to thank you for your time and ask you to join me in welcoming Scott up. To